everybody. It's Paul Burns, Executive Director of VPER, Vermont Public Interest Research Group, and I'm really glad today to be joined by Judith Enk, um, a longtime friend and colleague. Judith is a former Region uh, 2 EPA Administrator and the founder of Beyond Plastics. We're going to be talking today about plastics, about environmental enforcement in this uh, time of the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, but I also want to note that uh, Judith and I have been working together for a long time. We're colleagues <laughs> at Niper, uh, let's just say, a long time ago. And it, it's been an honor to work uh, with you and know you for all these years. And I've uh, appreciated the excellent work that you've done in and outside of government. And it's, uh, it's a, a great honor to have you joining us today. Thanks, Paul. I'm really thrilled to be with you. And I want to start by saying how impressed I, impressed I am with Vermont Perg. Um, you guys get stuff done. And when I boast about Vermont, some people will say, oh, it's Vermont. I'm like, yeah, it's Vermont. It's great. Vermont is a leader and a leader because of the um, stellar uh, organizing and policy work done by Vermont Perk. So um, my tremendous gratitude for people who su support Vermont Perk. This is gonna be a difficult time for nonprofits across the board. So if you're a Vermont PERG member listening in, whatever you donated last year, double it and get it in quick because these folks really know how to do good environmental advocacy and get results. I really appreciate that, Judith, very much. And you're not only a supporter of ours, but you've got uh, a role to play in your professional career in Vermont as well at Bennington College now. Yeah, I'm over the moon happy to be based at Bennington College in Southern Vermont. They graciously welcomed me as a visiting professor. Um, and I'm also a senior fellow at the college. They have something called the Center for the Advancement of Public Action, CAPA. And my whole career has been about public action. So yeah. it's really nice to be there. And Bennington College is the home of the nationwide uh, project that's called Beyond Plastics. So I, I could not be happier uh, than to be there. And conveniently, it's just 45 minutes from where I live in upstate New York. So it all works out. And one of my colleagues at the college is Senator Brian Campion. And um, he just is uh, a fun guy to talk to. And he certainly has made environmental protection a priority in his career. Senator Campion, who's of course a member of the Senate uh, Natural Resources and Energy Committee in the legislature, um, uh, is a, has been a real leader on many of these issues. And so a uh, nice shout out to him as well. Uh, Judith, you, we're here to talk mostly about plastics. So I'd be interested to know, given the wide range of environmental issues you've worked on over the course of your long career, what is it about plastics that made you want to create, found uh, beyond plastics and, and work on that issue? Well, I left the EPA the day that Donald Trump became president, and that was always the plan because I was a political appointee appointed by President Obama. And even if um, Hillary Clinton had won the presidency, I would planned to move on. I think every president deserves to bring their own people in. And so I had the luxury of a little bit of time to think about what is the issue I really wanted to have um, a leadership role on? Where could I really advance things? And it was an interesting time, you know, different offers came in from different places and um, I, I just decided I wanted to go back to my grassroots beginning and work in the arena of environmental advocacy to advance an issue. And of course, climate change was my first thought. Um, but I also realized, while we don't have nearly as, as many people working on climate change, we have even fewer working on plastic pollution. And the more I dug into this, the more research I did, the more conversations I initiated, I just was convinced that this is an issue that touches all of the environmental fields that I'm most interested in. It's a solid waste and recycling issue. It's a water quality issue, particularly for rivers and um, bays and, and oceans. Um, it is a climate change issue because plastics is mo made mostly from a byproduct of fracking called ethane. And it's a toxics issue because um, it's made from toxic chemicals. And it's an equity issue because we are, dis we are um, exporting 
so much plastic to other nations with the great hope that they are going to sort and recycle it. And, and that has not happened. So I want to uh, mention that on Earth Day, the Dis Discovery Channel will be showing a really powerful documentary called The Story of Plastics. And that for the first time looks at plastics through the lens of human rights. So it, it was all issues that I cared about. And I felt like public awareness was growing. There was not enough uh, policy expertise or grassroots support that would allow us to really make a difference. I'm all for people using less plastic in their personal lives. That's important. But we really need systemic change. And I'm a former federal regulator. You know, if you go to a surgeon, she tells you you need surgery. If you come to me, I think you need new laws and strong enforcement of those laws to affect change. So, um, you know, it, it was, it, the issue grabbed me right away. The hard thing was where to do it. And I decided to combine my interest in teaching. So I teach a class on plastic pollution at Bennington College and the college has grac graciously welcomed me there to have a home for Beyond Plastic. So thank you, Bennington College, for that. And you actually had an opportunity to bring at least a few of those students up to Montpelier to testify and, and join you in your testimony on the legislation that Vermont passed last year, um, which, which I know you had called and many of us picked up uh, the idea that this is a trifecta uh, piece of legislation. Would you just talk a, a little bit about that? Sure. So when um, Beyond Plastics got launched, I thought, okay, there's all this great science and information, but how do we organize on this issue? So um, we actually drafted a model bill called the Plastics Trifecta Bill, because I couldn't think of a better title. We're still shopping for a different type <laughs> of bag. Um, and it deals with plastic bags, plastic straws, and plastic polystyrene foam. And I remember you and I having a conversation and you were already working in this arena and we talked about, should we try to tackle all three at once? And you foolishly agreed. And, um, I, I remember saying, well, if it gets too hard, we can maybe remove one of these. But because of um, BPIRG's work and Conservation Law Foundation and uh, Toxics Action Center and other grassroots activists, this was the first plastic trifecta bill ever to be adopted into law. So that is a great accomplishment. Um, New York is doing pieces of it. Other states are doing pieces. No one's done all three at once until Vermont Perg did. And now um, we're you know, pretty close to getting it passed in the state of New Jersey, all three at once. And now we move to the all important stage of making sure that it is effectively enforced. Right. So Vermont's law, as you point out, it, it involves those three areas of the carry out bags, the straws, which would be made available upon request, and, uh, and the prohibition on the uh, expanded polystyrene foam for food uh, containers and so forth. Uh, it also had to drink stirrers, which is a little derivative of the straw. So you might call uh -huh. it a three and a half or a trifecta and a half there. Yeah. But that is all due to take effect on July 1st of this year. So not too far in the distant future. And uh, this is part of why we're talking today is that Vermont's law and other areas that are trying to pass laws are now facing a new wave of opposition from industry. But stepping back, we could think about the context for this, which is we now have COVID-19 and, and a pandemic and a, and a really serious uh, threat to human health. And that is affecting public policy across the board. And it should, you know, and, yes. and our governments are responding. No question about that. But it is also true, and this is not the first time we've said it, that industry doesn't never want to let a, a good crisis go to waste. And they, out of this kind of chaos and crisis, can look to try to exploit um, these opportunities. And, and one that comes to mind, just has come up in the last 24 hours, is at the federal level, the EPA essentially, and I want you to talk about this, but essentially saying they're gonna uh, give a pass to polluters um, at this point. So let's talk about that, and then, and then we'll talk about how that uh, relates to the, to the work on plastics. Sure, it's, it's all related. Um, 
I have been so concerned about the Trump administration's environmental record from, you know, right out of the gate, the day he was elected. And before COVID-19, we were dealing with the reality of over a hundred crucial federal environmental regulations being gutted or delayed, um, numbers, high numbers of scientists leaving the EPA, enforcement significantly down. But Paul, I have to say, nothing prepared me for the article I read last night that EPA is essentially giving a waiver to every company in the United States uh, uh, saying they don't have to comply with their environmental permits in our nation's environmental laws. This is stunning. And it's stunning because we know it will make people sick. And there's no justification for it. Uh, the big uh, polluters have been wanting uh, something like this for a while. Um, big polluters work at the EPA. The head of the EPA, Andrew Wheeler, is a former lobbyist for the coal industry. Um, another key player in the Trump orbit is Nancy Beck, who came directly from the American Chemistry Council. And they are exploiting this very legitimate um, public health crisis. And it just doesn't make sense. When I was at EPA, Hurricane Sandy hit. And I remember a large um, oil refinery in New Jersey wanted some flexibility on the sulfur content of the oil that they would be providing. Uh, you may recall in New York City and New, New, New Jersey, there, were, um, there was a gasoline shortage. People were waiting on, online for hours to get gasoline. So a very detailed proposal came into the EPA. I sat with my lawyers. We looked at it. Was this legitimate? And then I said, I didn't want to just hear from the lawyers. I wanted to hear from our scientists. What are the health impacts of not enforcing this one regulation on this one company. We ultimately decided to give them essentially a waiver for two weeks. They wanted it indefinitely. We said, no, you have to keep coming back every two weeks. We did it a second time. The third time they came back, we said no. And then they never came back again. The idea that you wouldn't even have to apply for the waiver, that the, this is just a sweeping get out of get jail for free card is just stunning. And we know that air pollution and water pollution crosses state boundaries. So this will, this will affect everyone. Um, ironically, research tells us that people with asthma and respiratory problems are more at risk during the coronavirus and other viruses um, if air pollution is a problem where they live. Your body can't fight viruses as effectively if you live in a polluted area. And there, no question about it, there will be more air pollution from this unlawful uh, policy from the Trump EPA. We can't afford to have it in effect, you know, even for a week. And they went retroactive. It, it took effect March 13th. No justification other than some of the companies are saying it may be hard for them to meet their legal requirements. It's, it's, um, it's amazing that we can still be stunned uh, by uh, the anti-environmental actions of the Trump administration, but this really is that sweeping um, and it is that dangerous um, at this time that it, is, um, it, it truly is shocking. What, what can we do or what, what can folks do um, at the local level, at the state level? Well, there are a couple things we can do. Your new environmental commissioner, Peter Walk, needs to um, um, step up environmental monitoring in Vermont so you can document if this is having an impact on air and water quality in Vermont. We very much need residents of Vermont to contact Attorney General T.J. Donovan and to ask him to sue the Trump administration in federal court to block this policy. If this is not struck down in court, this will be in effect until late January 
uh, even if there's a new occupant in the White House. And our lungs and our, our drinking water quality and our health cannot endure that long a period of time of widespread non-compliance. So everyone in Vermont should reach out to their attorney general. I'm sure he would team up with other attorney generals to try to get a case filed quickly. They need to work on it literally this weekend. And third, um, the governor of Vermont should weigh in with President Trump and say, this is ill-advised. This doesn't help the economy of Vermont and in fact will make uh, our health, our dire health situation even worse. So uh, those are some excellent recommendations. I will pledge that uh, uh, for VPIRG and on our website, we'll put some more information up there about how Thank people you. can engage on these things. Peter Walk is the commissioner of the Department of Environmental Conservation, you mentioned, who has a history in uh, New York State yeah. as well, but is a Vermonter um, uh, himself. And uh, and then T.J. Donovan is our Attorney General and, and obviously Governor Phil Scott each could potentially play a role here. So. Yeah, and I'm sure, I mean, I don't want to assume anything, but knowing Peter Walk, I'm sure he has concerns about this and he can be the data guy uh, and he can also organize other environmental commissioners around the country to try to beat this back. I know I'm asking a lot. This is a terrible time. People are taking care of their families and losing jobs. Um, but this is when bad stuff sneaks through, when um, the Trump administration thinks people either are not paying attention or don't care. But we are paying attention and we do care. So uh, along those same lines, bringing it back around to plastics, we're seeing the industry here, the, the, the plastics industry. You had mentioned before the American Chemistry Council is a you know, as the EPA uh, um, administrator there or a high level person there, that is the chemical industry. Those are the manufacturers right. of, of chemicals in this uh, country. They and uh, their kind of subsidiary and the plastics manufacturers and then the plastic bag manufacturers are all kind of joining forces here to push back against states that have existing laws to regulate plastic carryout bags or other single-use plastics um, and to potentially try to stop other states or local communities from moving forward with their programs. Is that right? Yes. I mean, the plastics industry started exploiting the coronavirus even before it was known how serious it was in, in the United States. When China uh, reduced manufacturing, the American Chemistry Council and their allies in uh, I call big plastic bag. Um, they, instead of big oil, they're big bag. Um, they started making the argument that New York should not go forward with its plastic bag ban, which took effect on March 1st of this year, because they said a reduction in manufacturing in China will result in fewer paper bags being available. Uh, and that turned out not to be the case. So we still have New York's law in effect. Um, it's important because New Yorkers use a staggering 23 billion plastic bags every year, which just kind of stops me in my tracks, according to our New York Department of Environmental Conservation. And I was looking forward to a spring where I didn't see so many plastic bags in the trees and parks and water bodies. Uh, plastic bag manufacturers sued New York to try to block the law from taking effect. They did not get a TRO, but they did get um, uh, New York DEC to agree to a delay. So the state law is not being enforced until May 15th. I don't know what's going to happen after May 15th, but to your point, Paul, the plastics PR machine is in overdrive and they are spreading information that's not accurate and also is not helpful during a time of crisis. I want my governor focused on things like, how do we get more ventilators to hospitals? I don't want him having to debate the plastic bag industry on whether or not uh, reusable bags are a source of coronavirus. They are not, by the way. There's no evidence that, um, reusable bags carry the coronavirus. However, and it's actually the opposite, we know that the coronavirus lasts longer 
on plastic surfaces. So here we are, and my recommendation is that uh, the governor of Vermont do nothing. Let's let July come and see what's happening. In the meantime, you know, lots of people in Vermont are still using reusable bags. They don't need a law to tell them to do that. So do wash your reusable bags as you regularly launder your clothing. Um, wash the bags frequently. Um, and then there is a concern that um, health, um, that supermarket employees who are working so hard and who are so underpaid, uh, there's a concern that maybe they're exposed to germs when they pack uh, groceries in um, reusable bags. There's an easy solution to that. Pack your own groceries. So if I were to be out at the supermarket, and I'm not because I'm staying put, I would have much more confidence uh, in bringing my own reusable bag that I know when I laundered and then only I am touching. So I would pack the groceries myself. So it's only my hands on those bags, which is vastly different than plastic bags, which travel the world and sit in supermarkets for hours with many people touching them. So I think we have a workable solution and in fact, um, many Trader Joe's stores are allowing people to bring their reusable bags as long as they do their own packing. So I think that's quite reasonable. Yeah, so it's important. In fact, I think one of the studies that industry has used to say, oh, you know, reusable bags may have germs. One, they're not talking about COVID-19, right. there haven't been any studies on that, but even bacteria, even a bacteria that isn't likely to get you sick, um, it can be removed by washing those bags. I mean, 99.9%, yeah. .9%, just like your Lysol or Clorox, yeah. you, you, can, you can address that problem by washing the bags. Right. And, and there is no reason to think that those bags are more uh, dangerous or contaminated than your own clothing or the dollar bill in your wallet or your credit card or your phone. I mean, it, Right. We do, we do all face these challenges now, and um, I, I think your recommendations are right on in terms of what we can advise people to do is that if you're using reusable bags, as we encourage you to, make sure they're clean. Make sure you're washing right. them after they're used, just as you are your clothing now. You're more conscientious about that than ever before, and I think uh, that's certainly a good thing. And if you can, bag your own uh, uh, groceries. Yeah. Uh, give give yeah. the cashier a break for crying out loud. Right, you know? yeah, they're working hard enough. And I, and I just point out that the major study that the plastic industry is pointing to was done 10 years ago. And they looked at 84, a whopping 84 reusable bags. And in their words, they said reusable grocery bags can be a breeding ground for dangerous foodborne bacteria and pose a serious risk to public health. They said that 10 years ago, and that did not happen over the past 10 years. And I might add that that study was funded by the American Chemistry Council. American Chemistry Council, again, are the manufacturers yeah. of these chemicals. Yeah, exactly. And if, you know, I will add, I, I go even one step further, if people are, if they can't do their own packing or for whatever reason don't bring reusable bags, at least ask for paper bags because the paper bags are typically made from recycled material and can be easily recycled as opposed to plastic bags, which are made from fossil fuels, chemicals, and their recycling rate is well under 5%. So, so for Vermont, just stay the course, uh, Governor, don't do anything, and then you can revisit this in, in mid-June. I think that's great, and, and it, it just reminds me that if, if, if you are collecting, for whatever reason, any of these plastic bags, which also come on other containers, bread bags mm -hmm. and the like, we have heard that there is a pause uh, in place now in terms of recycling of those um, bags at grocery stores, which typically would collect those. So if it's possible for you to, to keep them in a place where you could bring them back um, uh, as this crisis abates, I think that's wonderful because you can't put it in your recycling. Don't, don't put right. those bags in with your other recycling because that uh, messes up the works at the right. uh, materials recovery facility. So don't, don't do that. 
Um, and also in Vermont, uh, the retailers have been allowed not to take back the cans and bottles under our bottle bill program um, at this point. So again, if you're able to keep those uh, until such time as that process is reopened, um, I think that's great. If you decide to recycle those, know that uh, some of those things are not able to be recycled at as high a level um, as they otherwise would. So if you take your glass bottle back for redemption, there's a decent chance that's going to turn into another glass bottle, be recycled into a new glass bottle. If you put it into your blue bin for recycling, um, it's much less likely because it all kind of gets contaminated together in that single stream system. I don't want to spend a lot more time on that now, but just to say, uh, even though um, you know, it's, it's better than throwing it away to put those items mm -hmm. in your blue right. bin for recycling. Um, uh, it's really best if you can take them back for redemption because they're more likely to be recycled at a higher level. At that right. Absolutely. And um, I've been saving, it, it's been a real eye opener for me. I try to avoid plastic, but I have plastic bread bags and frozen foods. So I've been saving those bags and, and the perfect bag for it is an old bird seed bag and you can just fill it and smush it. But it's amazing how much I've collected just in the last three weeks. Yeah. So, it, you know, it all depends um, if you have space. Yeah, right, right. So uh, do the best you can, I think, is one thing that's a, a common uh, theme for a lot of folks right now, particularly those of us who have small children at home who are going to be home with us for uh, a mm -hmm. long time with school now closed for the year um, here in Vermont. Um, but just in all sorts of things, we want you to do the best you can, but one thing that we can do is just encourage our, our government officials not to allow industry to exploit this crisis and right. to allow our air and water to be more polluted or to allow the rollback of uh, important laws that we've all worked hard to help pass. So I, I think that's a, an important message coming out of this. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of kids, I want to mention that beyond plastics, uh, we've been reimagining ourselves. How are we going to do our work differently and still be relevant? So um, we've got a couple on online opportunities coming up. One is next week we will announce a plastic pollution virtual film festival where we've um, selected five of the best films on plastic pollution and, and encouraging people to watch. Um, one is called Microplastic Madness made by our friends at Cafeteria Culture, and it's a great movie for kids. Um, so we'll announce that on Monday. It'll all be on our website, www.beyondplastics.org, so plural, beyondplastics.org. And then another thing that your son might be interested in is we're launching a plastic pollution poster contest for kids aged kindergarten to senior in high school and uh, three age categories. Just do a poster on plastic pollution, whatever you're interested in, take a photograph and send it to us. And um, these kids may be lucky winners. And so that will be announced on our website also. That's great. We'll certainly provide a link to your website and, and we're po posting get more information on that. What a great idea as um, people have some time on their hands um, and the kids at home now. Mm -hmm. So. Judith, I want to thank you. I hope you'll come back. We'll, we'll do this again as, um, sure. as my pleasure merits. Um, but great talking with you. Keep up the great work and we'll be in touch. You too. Thanks.